Sometimes sellers of such solar collectors can tell how much heat will be produced by their goods, however we can not always get the necessary information from the sellers, or we will not always trust their words. So, let's learn how to predict the thermal capacity and heat production from various types of solar collectors, regardless of the words of their sellers, and including for collectors which are made in a home workshop. The end of this video will show a more accurate method of the forecast which is based on similar tables, however now I will talk about this very simple, but very approximate method on the basis of similar maps which can be found through these words. For example, this is a map for Europe, and one square meter of horizontal surface of this region receives 1000 kilowatt hours of solar energy annually. But this region receives almost 2000 kilowatt hours per 1 square meter of its horizontal surface per year. Of course, our solar collector will be able to convert only a certain proportion of this solar energy into useful heat, and usually it will be in the range of 20 to 50 percent, and it is obvious that the percentage will be less for cases of homemade solar collectors. So, if we want to predict the annual heat production of our solar collector, we multiply a certain proportion of the solar energy by the collector area, and it is obvious that the area of this unglazed collector is this rectangle. The area of such collectors is this rectangle inside their transparent cover. Such solar collectors have this area which is almost equal to the area of their mirrors. The area of this solar heater is the multiplication of the length of its black pipe by the outer diameter of the pipe. The area of a similar solar collector is the multiplication of the total length of all tubes by the diameter of their selective coating. This is one of my solar heaters, and it consists of this black wall and this polymer sleeve for water, and the area of the heater is this rectangle inside its transparent film. This is a similar solar heater, but this is a reflective wall, and the area of the heater is also this rectangle. Now I am showing how much solar energy goes through one square meter for moments when these photos were taken. This is the sky in central Ukraine, at 48 degrees north latitude where the winter sun is about 20 degrees above the horizon, and this fact is the main cause why the sun is more powerful in the summer than in the winter, but the closer to the equator, the smaller the difference. Obviously, our collector is able to take only a certain percentage of the solar energy which comes to its surface from the sun, and usually the thermal capacity of our collector will be in the range from 200 to 700 watts per square meter at midday, but the capacity is drastically reduced in the morning and evening, and I will talk about this phenomenon in a few minutes. Let us suppose for example, that we want to buy this solar collector and its seller tells us about such parameters of the collector where we should pay attention to the following. This is the area of the collector. This parameter will be important to us in a few minutes, and now we pay attention to these two energy parameters, and we write them on a blank piece of paper. This efficiency will be multiplied by the solar radiation flux, and the result of this multiplication, is solar energy which is caught by our collector. Unfortunately, our collector is losing some share of the solar energy, and the cause of the losses is the fact that the temperature of fluid inside these collector pipes is usually greater than the ambient temperature, and therefore the collector will lose its heat due to heat leakages through its glass and through the thermal insulation of its northern wall, due to infrared radiation from this plate and due to other causes. So, if we want to calculate the heat losses of our collector, we multiply this coefficient by the temperature difference between the collector fluid and the surrounding air. It is obvious that the difference between these results, is the thermal capacity of each square meter of our solar collector. We can see that this was an example for the noon of a summer day when the temperature of the collector fluid is 70 degrees Celsius, however I am now showing a similar example, but for the noon of a winter day. And now the thermal capacity is noticeably less due to a decrease in the ambient temperature and a decrease in the solar radiation flux. We take a blank piece of paper and write the thermal capacity of our collector for the noon of a sunny day. Then we multiply the capacity by this number of hours, and this result is the amount of heat which is produced from one square meter of our collector during an absolutely sunny day, but the closer to the equator. 
the smaller the difference between these summer and winter days. Of course, this is a very approximate forecast, and I will explain such a more accurate forecast of the heat production in a few minutes. However we remember similar solar collectors which constantly turn according to the movement of the sun across the sky. These cases may require to write 8 hours or more here, especially for the summer heat production near the Arctic Circle, and it is obvious that these summer hours may be greater in the case of evacuated tubes because they can have good thermal capacity in the morning and in the evening. Let we already know the average heat production of our collector during an absolutely sunny day, and now we can multiply the daily heat production by the annual number of sunny days in our region. This map shows the number of sunny days for some European cities, and for example, Berlin can expect such annual heat production from one square meter of our collector, but I remind you that this is only an approximate forecast. The Internet can give us similar graphs which show how much solar radiation goes through a fixed southern surface during the day, and for example, we can notice that the solar radiation at 8 o'clock is about two times less than at noon. But these graphs are not the only cause of reducing the capacity of our solar collector in the morning and evening compared to midday. The second cause is that we must multiply this solar radiation by such coefficient which is commonly called this term, and this is the angle of incidence of sunlight on our solar collector, and this range corresponds to the middle of the day, but morning and evening have large angles of the incidence within this range. A physicist can explain our coefficient by the fact that the more the sunbeams incline towards the surface of the collector, the smaller the proportion of solar radiation absorbed by this dark plate and passes through this glass. Sometimes the seller can tell us the coefficient of his solar collector, and here we see our coefficient for the angle of incidence of 50 degrees. We can use this graph which corresponds to a traditional flat plate solar collector. But other types of solar collectors usually have similar graphs, except for evacuated tubes which approximately correspond to such graph. However, our coefficient should not be taken into account in cases of such solar heaters which constantly follow the sun, and these cases require the use of not such graphs, but those which will be described in a few minutes. I remind you of this coefficient which helps us more accurately calculate the heat losses from our collector. This coefficient is added to our second formula where it is twice multiplied by the temperature difference between the collector fluid and the ambient air. So, now we ourselves can calculate the thermal capacity of various types of solar collectors, for example using this table of their energy parameters, and this next table shows their thermal capacity for cases of such temperature differences between the collector fluid and the ambient air. That is why these solar heaters are our only options for cases of high temperatures, but if we need low temperature heat, these types of solar collectors are the best choice because they are many times cheaper than other alternatives. So, let's prepare a similar table which will be completed by us, and here we will write the amount of heat from one square meter of our collector during an absolutely sunny day which begins with these hours and ends with this time. Suppose we do not make complex calculations of this angle of incidence of sunlight on the surface of the collector, and we use these standard angle values which are the basis for filling this column according to this graph which was described two minutes ago. This column should describe the solar radiation which falls on one square meter of our collector, and I took these values from this graph. It will be easier for us if we think that similar graphs for different regions and different months will be the same. But here we have to stretch the graph according to the length of our day from sunrise to sunset, and let the graph height be 900 for a summer day and 800 for a winter day. I remind you that this is the efficiency of our collector, and we write its value in all cells of this column. So, now we have to complete this column which describes how much solar energy is caught by our collector, and this column is the result of multiplying these three columns. Here we write the average temperature of the fluid inside the collector, and now it is the temperatures for the task of heating water of a tank from a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius in the morning to 70 degrees Celsius in the evening. But these temperatures will be different if our collector is used for another task, and for example, these are temperatures for the task of heating pool water. 
This is the ambient temperature, and we can notice that this is an example of a sunny day in Central Europe in August. Here we write the multiplication of this column by this coefficient of our collector, and thus, this column describes the losses of useful heat from our collector. Obviously, the thermal capacity of our collector is the difference between this column and this. Then we complete this column which is the multiplication of this column by the time interval of this column, and we see that the interval is 1 hour. So, the sum of this column is the heat production forecast from 1 square meter of our solar collector during one absolutely sunny day at such temperatures of the liquid and the air. This is a more complex table which has this additional column to take account of this coefficient of our collector. So, we multiply this coefficient by this column twice, and the result of the multiplication is written to this column. It is obvious that now the thermal capacity is equal to this column from which is deducted these two columns. The calculation of these solar heaters is easier because these columns have such values. But this column uses another graph which will be described in about two minutes. We need to complete a similar table, and here we write the heat production from one square meter of our solar collector during an absolutely sunny day for these four months by the method I just described. These four months are important because they are solstices and equinoxes. Of course, we can do similar calculations for these eight months too. But the accuracy of the annual forecast will not be radically affected if we complete these cells based on our intuition, rather than the calculations. Here we must write the number of sunny days for different months, and usually I take the data from this site where we can find similar tables, and here we see the percentage of sunny days for different months, but unfortunately, not all cities of that site have the information on sunny days. Obviously. This column is a multiplication of these two columns, and its sum is the amount of heat which will be generated from one square meter of our solar collector within one year. Of course, my experiments and researches use more sophisticated calculation methods on the basis of similar tables, but my methods have a very complicated explanation. For example, I often do complex calculations of this angle of incidence, and I often refuse this universal graph replacing them with more adequate methods for cases of some types of solar collectors. In addition, we see that I take into account the cosine of the angle of incidence, but this fact requires the use of similar daily solar radiation graphs for a surface which is constantly perpendicular to the sun rays from dawn to dusk. Interestingly, these graphs should also be used for the case of such solar heaters which follow the sun from morning till evening and more accurate calculations take into account only part of the solar radiation which is called the term direct radiation. Of course, our calculations will never have perfect accuracy, and we did not take into account various heat losses, including from our heat storage and from pipes between the collectors and the storage. In addition, usually we will have a lot of surplus heat which can be produced by the collectors, but we do not need it. Moreover, we will lose part of the thermal capacity due to the aging of the collectors, due to dirt and snow on their surface and due to other causes. That is why I often worsen these energy parameters to more adequately calculate the heat production. But on the other hand, sometimes our collectors can produce heat during cloudy hours, and I remind you that our calculations did not take into account this possibility. And now I show examples of solar energy flux from overcast sky of central Ukraine. Of course, we understand that the capacity of our solar collector in the case of an overcast sky will be several dozen times less than in the case of an uncovered sun, and the temperature of our useful heat will be very low. For example, now I show experiment when this collector heated the water inside its pipes to a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius when the sky was so cloudy and the ambient temperature was 4 degrees Celsius above zero. In addition, our calculations did not take into account such cases when a cloud temporarily covers the sun, and we see that the solar radiation flux from a similar sky is several times greater than for the case of completely overcast sky.